Okay. Um, okay, got it. So thank you, thank you for being here. Um, so um, I'm uh, right now a professor um, at Forschung uh, from Jülich and Aachen. I used to be also at Irvine, and I'm going to be talking about um, how to train your neuromorphic hardware and or how to use synaptic plasticity in your neuromorphic card. I slightly changed the title, but I'm sorry about that. And I added here today uh, because this is very much um, oriented towards what you can do with the current technology. So when, when we think about learning, um, well, one thing we think about is this type of learning that is shown in this figure. So if I show, tell you, for example, the objects in the red box are called tufas, and I ask you to find the other tufas, um, you'll have no problem finding uh, these. You see one here, you see one here, you see one here, uh, you, see, you see one here, you see one here, you see one here, uh, and so on. So what you've done here is just basically out of these three exemplars, um, and if you've never seen this uh, particular figure before, you were able to recognize the other objects. So you've learned what a tufa is, and quite honestly, you've learned it with a good generalization uh, capability, right? Because the other tufas are, are actually a little bit different. So this is one of the most amazing aspects, uh, one of the um, uh, abilities uh, of the brain to learn quickly. And uh, of course, we would, uh, we ask the question, so how can we do this in our hardware? Since we build brain-like systems, maybe we should have the capability of um, doing this kind of learning. So when I mean learning, um, I'm not going to be talking about the kind of learning that was discussed in the first week. So we had uh, first Terry Stewart tell us about you know, the power consumption of learning, how much uh, energy is required to train, for example, one of these transformer networks, and maybe these different technologies can reduce that uh, uh, energy. Uh, we also had Kwabena talk about the scaling of these systems, in particular for training these large uh, networks, uh, and how we can move uh, into multiple dimensions, uh, uh, implement these networks in multiple dimensions and use sparse activities such as in spiking neurons to reduce the power of learning. So this is not the kind, so the solutions I'm going to talk about is actually orthogonal to these, right? So what I'm going to talk about is more this kind of learning that we can do on our hardware. And I think frankly, the only learning that's going to be relevant in the five to 10 years. I think this, if we think of neuromorphic engineering, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to tackle the kind of problems that Kwabena and Terry uh, talked about uh, in, these, um, uh, in, in the first week. So uh, I, hopefully you've also attended the talk, uh, the great talk of uh, uh, Friedemann earlier, who told us how we can do gradient-based learning and spike in neural network and, and how these translate into synaptic plasticity rules, which can, for example, be implemented uh, in hardware. And the main components of this, of, of this gradient-based learning and spike in neurons was that you had this differentiable uh, leaky integrant and fire neural model by means of this surrogate gradient, which here I just uh, summarize as, uh, as this line here, where basically we have this smooth, um, activation derivative of the activation function uh, when we optimize a network. By the way, uh, feel free to interrupt me um, as I'm speaking. I prefer this to be a discussion rather than a monologue. So uh, from the neural model, then we can apply the, the rules of gradient descent that we know, such as back propagation through time or equivalently uh, real-time uh, recurrent learning. And we end up with learning rules here that can be um, uh, basically local, so synaptic plasticity rules. So we there are a couple of challenges that also Friedemann and others have discussed in implementing gradient descent in spiking neural networks. Um, the first two um, that were discussed today by Friedemann actually was, um, as I mentioned just earlier, is that this activation function is non-differentiable. So that's where we use the surrogate gradient. So that's one solution to, uh, to this problem. Uh, the other problem is that because we have spiking neurons with their internal dynamics, right? So Friedem was saying uh, quite correctly that a neuron is like a recurrent network in itself. This automatically introduces a temporal credit assignment problem. In other words, how do we know if the particular output uh, of a network is the right one, given that the input, uh, the relevant input was provided uh, uh, a while ago? Okay, so one solution to this is to use uh, these ideas of uh, sparse Jacobians or um, 
or other uh, approximations of the, of the Jacobian there. Um, of course, the big uh, issue also not only for spiking neural networks, but for deep neural networks is to solve the deep credit assignment uh, problem. With, because we're going to be neuromorphic hardware and in general, any uh, physical computing device um, operates with local information, we need these learning rules to be able to do credit assignment without basically beaming all this um, information through the entire network. So we need to build information. So learning channels in order to um, assign uh, credits in a, a spatially. So we saw a, a number of different um, solutions to the spatial credit assignment problems. So Masa Gers gave a really nice talk in the first week. Uh, we just saw today actually Ben Benny gave a great talk about how you can use uh, deep feedback control in order to uh, also um, approximate these learning channels. Um, if you had a chance to look at my tutorial, I also talk about some some methods um, for for solving that that are anchored in um, feedback alignment. There's one other, I think a minor problem, but I'm just going to mention it here because I think it's an important one, is that um, this learning rule, if you implement it as is, would mean that you need to make a synaptic update at every time step, right? So it's in this case, it's a discrete time system, but if you design it as a continuous time system, it means that you should make updates at every time step, which is of course, you know, a synaptic update means that you're making a change in the memory, which costs uh, uh, energy, um, and you don't want to do it at every time step. So in fact, there is um, a simple solution to this, uh, which I'll just briefly talk about now, and as a segue, introduce some other concept coming uh, later. And I call this uh, error triggered learning. So there's a really simple um, a solution to this problem, which um, I think the best way to think of it is with STDP. So if you know STDP is spike timing dependent plasticity, it's a learning rule that tells you you make updates based on a presynaptic spike and a post or when a, a, a postsynaptic spike occurs. Right? So there are these two events. In error triggered learning, what you would do is provided that you have this three factor rules, uh, well, just like we saw in Friedemann's talk, uh, implementing the surrogate gradient descent. Um, instead of making updates on the presynaptic terms, which would be this term here, on the postsynaptic term, on, which is this term here, you can make updates based on this third factor here. And you see the, the, the name error triggered learning um, appears, uh, uh, it comes from this, so that this term here um, usually represents something like an error. And if you can represent this as, a, as an event or a spike train, it means that you make updates when these events occur, which is very natural, right? Because you should make updates to your model if you're making a mistake, right? On presynaptic and postsynaptic updates, they can occur anytime, even if you're not making updates. So, so this is why we do updates based on these, um, uh, on these terms. So a very simple way of implementing this is just to basically apply a threshold uh, to, uh, to this error. And the, you, you basically reduce the threshold uh, as you train. The beauty of this is that it ends up being an extremely simple learning rule, which has three terms, uh, which uh, you know, uh, is, is sparse in time. You only make these updates when you need it. Okay, so this solves the problem of doing multiple synaptic updates per um, uh, to, uh, making updates at every uh, time step. Uh, the uh, accuracies that we get, we get, we do get, of course, a, sm a very slight uh, per performance loss. But this is uh, also related to how we chose to control the um, uh, this threshold here, which I think can be done in more clever ways. There's another interesting aspect in this learning rule, which is not directly related to the fact that it's error triggered learning. So that two of these terms uh, are local. So this is, has postsynaptic, this has presynaptic, and there's this non-local term. This non-local term has generally one per neuron, just like we saw in Ben's talk, there's a control that comes into every neuron, but not every synapse, right? Uh, whereas this local term, well, it can be implemented, it usually requires, um, uh, so indexing uh, the synapses. So if we're building an architecture, um, it's actually best to also, uh, to separate these two terms in the hardware itself, where let's assume that you have two types, of, uh, you build hardware that has two types of cores, one which is a neuromorphic core that's going to implement these forward dynamics, a leaky integrated fire neuron, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's going to implement the part of the learning rule, which I should have added here actually, but which is, uh, it implements this local part. Whereas the, um, 
these processing cores are going to implement this loss scale calculation, this error calculation. This really makes sense uh, because you know loss functions are often uh, they often change from task to task, right? Depending on which task you do, uh, you might be solving regression, navigation, or, uh, or problems like that, which can be very different. But ultimately, the two local terms are going to remain the same because that is inherent to the neuron and the synaptic dynamics. Okay, so you can create the neuromorphic core. You can you can put um, to your heart's content the uh, uh, all the sorts of uh, hard wiring um, that you need, but so long as it can implement this um, these two terms for for the gradient descent. But then this uh, processing core is going to be the um, the flexible one, so it, it can be, for example, a general purpose uh, CPU, a little bit like the Loihi um, x86 cores. And the communication here is now, thanks to this event triggered learning, will be handled uh, through these uh, spike uh, events. So we can still um, by, we can distribute the learning, but still make it efficient thanks to this error, error triggered learning. So I think this is one of the um, cleverer ways of, of implementing three factor rules uh, in neuromorphic hardware today. Um, there's some other perks to the learning rule that we implemented, namely that the, the same uh, uh, vector matrix multiply hardware can actually also compute uh, part of the gradients without actually having to do any uh, computation. So it's just because it's the same quantities that are required for the forward pass. Okay. So, um, when, I'm, when we talk, think about this TUFA problem, so what I started with is this quick learning. Yes, uh, hello? No, I thought, oh, it's just an echo, somebody's echoing. Okay, that's fine. So um, think of online learning on the hardware. And as soon as we think of online learning, there's a list of problems that is just endless, right? And I'm going to tell you some of those uh, problems. Um, and just keep in mind that, you know, if we think of synaptic plasticity um, in the brain or in hardware, it's, it, it is by definition going to be online, right? So you have this, this local synaptic plasticity dynamics, which is going to compute the, uh, the, the updates, but this is going to happen as your network is experiencing the world. So the first problem that might occur, of course, is going to be catastrophic forgetting, right? So we know from machine learning, statistical machine learning, that one of the uh, requirements for it to work is that your data must be presented in IID fashion. Okay. If you don't do this, then you get the problems of catastrophic forgetting. Okay, so uh, we you know that's been documented uh, extensively, and uh, you know, various solutions have been proposed. Uh, none of them which work perfectly, uh, but uh, you know we're cer certainly getting better at that. We know, of course, deep neural networks. Whether you're doing um, you know, reinforcement learning or or just classification and so on, requires a lot of data. So it's very data inefficient. So if you start from training from scratch, um, even on hardware, this is going to take you forever. And that's compounded by the fact that the real world is basically batch size one, right? So you're just seeing data experiencing the world uh, as it comes. So in addition to this, well, of course, labeled learning is somehow not very compatible with, um, uh, uh, with online learning. So we need to uh, uh, basically throw away that kind of label learning and think of more uh, you know, self-supervised learning. And as soon as we move into hardware, especially analog hardware, we're hit by all sorts of non-idealities. So these non-idealities can be just that we have um, uh, non-linearities in the hardware. We have also requirements on precision uh, for using a resistive switching media. Then you know, we're going to have endurance problems and so on. So this, this list really goes on. If you want to implement online learning on neuromorphic hardware, um, this uh, it's it's pretty much um, impossible to do it in a tabula rasa fashion today. So some of the solutions I mentioned, you know, these uh, techniques um, that, uh, that uh, try to overcome catastrophic forgetting, they use these, um, they augment the synapse with new uh, dimensions. Uh, Friedemann has some work on that as well as this one here, which is uh, from DeepMind. Another way is to make the data IID um, by, by building these pseudo replay uh, mechanisms. Um, that doesn't really solve the other problems here, but it certainly solves, it can solve the problem of catastrophic forgetting for some cost. The other two options, which are, these are um, um, 
actually the options I'll be talking more about today are meta learning or uh, transfer learning, as well as federated learning to some extent. So for example, what you do in meta learning or transfer learning is that you pre-train your network on a battery of tasks, which then you somehow uh, map onto your edge uh, device. Okay, that's how you would use meta learning for, for mobile applications. The idea uh, of, of meta learning is that you, you find, um, or some of these, one of these methods in particular is that you find an initial set of parameters from which you require only a few updates to reach a, um, uh, a suitable parameter. Right. So then there, this comes with two advantages, uh, actually many advantages. One, which is that, well, you weren't learn very quickly. Right? So if you only need to make a few steps, uh, in order to reach a target solution, then you don't need much data either. So that solves the data inefficiency problem. And also it's going to mitigate the catastrophic forgetting problem. Because if you're just making a few updates, you're not going to be forgetting much either. Okay, so, um, and, and the same applies to a lesser extent with transfer learning, because I think it's just a, a poor way of doing uh, meta learning, but also to federated learning. We have multiple devices learn uh, simultaneously and transmit their gradients and then update on the edge devices. So I'll be talking more about meta learning and transfer learning right now. So we apply this idea of meta uh, transfer learning in this case, actually to uh, hardware, in this case, the low uh, hardware. So this is my student, Kenneth Stewart. Who, what he did is that he trained a network um, for DBS gestures. So this is just a recognition task that was uh, put together with, uh, from IBM. And then he transferred these parameters onto the Loihi, which is in this case easy to do because Loihi is digital. And then we, we trained in this case, just the last layer in order to learn new, uh, new gestures. And this worked on a single shot pretty well. Um, so you see, we get accuracies that go from 65% to 80% on completely new gestures, depending on the number of shots. By shot, I mean here that that is really the number of presentations of the, um, of the gesture. And this was, uh, by the way, this learning used the, the whole full stack of surrogate gradients um, that, that we've, saw, we've seen so far. So this is a pretty much a success story. And given that we just did transfer learning here, of course, we have high hopes to you know, boost these numbers uh, substantially. And this is actually just, you know, just really back to the first uh, slide. Uh, this is exactly the idea of TUFA. So instead of showing it uh, these weird shapes, we're showing new gestures and learning these new gestures from uh, um, this TBS camera. Okay. Another solution that, uh, that is of interest here. So I mentioned this problem that we, we so that required, actually, let me just go back. You see there's a keyboard here, which just should be a cue that we're actually, uh, Kenneth was actually pressing the keyboard as um, he was showing the gestures, uh, which is really, you know, kind of a, a, a party killer here, right? So what if we can replace this uh, keyboard with something um, that's um, automatic that actually somehow finds a pseudo label for us? And for this, we, we trained this, uh, this uh, pretty elaborate hybrid spiking neural network, artificial neural network uh, variational autoencoder, um, which is basically trained to place, uh, to encode uh, gestures um, of, uh, from, from, the, from the DVS gestures data set into an embedding um, in which um, it would um, basically generate that embedding would give us labels for, that we can use for, for training the Loihi um, as we just did uh, before. And you see, the reason why this is a hybrid, so not fully spiking, is because um, once we've trained this network, this SNN, um, we don't actually need the decoder. We only need this uh, embedding part. And this embedding part is actually just a normal spiking neural network, very similar to the one that we use for the uh, DVS gestures task. And so we can take this part and directly load it um, onto the low heat. We haven't done this yet. This is pretty recent work. But the cool thing is that if you show to this network three gestures it hasn't seen before, it's going to place that embedded uh, the vector in that latent space into very nearby positions, right? So thereby it is actually doing as you would expect from an autoencoder doing this clustering that we can, and we can use this uh, basically as a label for training. Okay, so um, in other words, you know, without going too much into the details, we, we, we created here a spiking neural network for generating pseudo labels, which we can use for supervised uh, learning in hardware. Okay, so now coming to uh, the more uh, interesting part, because I think personally, 
is um, meta learning. So what we've done so far was uh, in the previous slides was about transfer learning. So this is about uh, meta learning. And this particular method, which is really nice, is called a model agnostic meta learning. Um, really allows you to, to meta train any neural network that's uh, two times differentiable in order to find this um, initial set of parameters. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this initial set of parameters that allows you to do few shot learning. And it does this using uh, what may appear a little bit um, uh, you know, difficult to understand um, uh, at, at first, um, but it, it basically trains using two loops. Um, one, which is the inner loop. The inner loop training is what you would normally do if you train an MNIST network. And the outer loop, which basically trains this initialization parameter, but it trains it through the inner loop update. So basically, to, to put it in simple words, you're, you're learning to learn, right? You're training the network uh, in order to find this parameter. Because the network, the update itself, um, depending on your network, is also differentiable. You can actually differentiate through it. Okay? So what this does is provided that you train this on a family of tasks that are probably somewhat related. In the, um, and it, it, this can learn uh, initializ uh, uh, initialization such that you uh, you get updates, uh, you, you get a uh, few shot, uh, accurate few shot learning. I should have mentioned that before and I forgot to do this. Uh, this is actually a, a project that we started last year in 20, so virtual 10 wide Telluride 2020. So um, what I'm reporting here is actually the results <laughs> that we got after the, uh, the workshop was over. Um, what MAML uh, does is that it, um, it learns, and uh, this is just taking the words from the original paper, it's learning internal features uh, that are basically applicable to this family of tasks in, in T. And there's a cool uh, fact here, which is that we've seen these surrogate gradients. Well, it turns out that surrogate gradients are also differentiable. Right? So we can easily calculate surrogate Hessians, although I'm not sure that's a good term here. Um, but what that means is that we can actually by the fact that it's also model agnostic, we can actually plug in our differentiable surrogate spiking neural networks inside MAML uh, and train it. And so that works, uh, turns out pretty well. Now, the problem that we have is that we need to construct this family of tasks, right? So you need, we need to, uh, meta learning usually relies on this pretty special um, or, or well-defined uh, task structure where you do you meta train, you meta validate, you meta test and so on. So we had to build a way of generating tasks. Um, and so we did this by using these double, uh, com basically these combination tasks. Um, and there was, this is you know, inspired from examples that already existed in the machine learning uh, field. So we have, uh, for example, this double NMNIST. So if I would, I don't have, this is not a video, but if it were a video, you would see these two digits moving around. Um, and the goal of the network is to classify uh, basically not uh, the, from zero to 100, but out of five, five different combinations that it's shown at every task. Um, we did the same for American Sign Language. So in this case, it's like two hands doing American Sign Language. Okay, so training the SNN actually, uh, so really surprisingly, we saw it uh, worked almost as well as the uh, deep neural networks that come with uh, or that were implemented by the, uh, the, uh, the MAML uh, authors. Um, and uh, really absolutely almost no difference on NMNIST and sometimes even better uh, with the, um, on the American Sign Language. This is because our SNN is actually recurrent neural networks. So it's somewhat more complex uh, than this ANN, which was just a convolutional neural network. Um, Okay, so I hope if Toby is here, I hope he's happy that this is less than 1%, though it's not really comparable. Okay, um, so here's um, the, the actual punchline. And if there's anything that, uh, that you should remember, it's, it's going to be these three points and why I'm excited about meta learning and why meta learning is the future for neuromorphic hardware learning, hardware. So one is algorithmic simplicity. So the inner loop update, this one here, this is really the equation that's implemented there. So it's, it's just straight stochastic gradient descent. It's not Adam, it's not Adam X, so it doesn't have these additional states, okay? 
So the learning rule itself, the, the inner loop, which is presumably what you would like to have implemented on your hardware is just straight stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so that's, that's a win. Another win is that, well, we're doing few shot learning. So meaning that we need to make relatively large functional changes in the network in just one step. So, so this means that the learning rate is generally pretty large. Right. So in this case, the learning rate is set to one, although that doesn't really mean much because the network has its own constants inside. But what this means is that you don't have to have as much precision required as you usually need for doing deep learning on a uh, in a tabular RASA fashion. The other thing that's interesting is that um, we don't need so much endurance, right? If you're using resistive switching devices, this just means one update per, uh, per device. Okay, so endurance is really not a problem anymore. So coming to resistive switching devices. So there's a, there's a whole family of devices out there. I'm not going to go into the details of that also because I'm not really an expert uh, in these yet. Um, but um, the, the most, some of the, uh, these devices have these problems which are um, that they update in a nonlinear fashion. So as as if you make an update, um, if you potentiate, for example, and you're, you're at this state of conductance, it's going to make a much larger update than if you were at this point here and you make an update, you see the delta is going to be much smaller. The slope is much smaller. So this um, is the problem of asymmetric nonlinearities as you're updating conductances. This is one of the problem, many problems that you have in these memristor devices, which I should say, they don't only come with problems. Memristor devices are really interesting because you can scale them up uh, massively. Um, and you know, this, it's, it's a potential way that we can uh, uh, scale up these neuromorphic hardware. And uh, this comes from, um, uh, so this is uh, another work which uses the same kind of nonlinearity and it's looking at how that non asymmetric nonlinearity uh, affects performance. And you see that if the more nonlinear you make these devices, uh, the, basically the, the accuracy uh, goes down very quickly when you try to use this device um, for learning. So this is a problem. Um, but it turns out that this actual nonlinearity can be expressed as a compact, uh, simple model. In fact, see these are actually come from a model. It's a linear model um, and um, it can be differentiated. So uh, what this means is that I can actually take that nonlinearity, plug it into the inner loop of my uh, meta learning and then do my outer loop training through that nonlinearity. So what this means is that it's going to find an initial set of parameters that is adapted to this nonlinear behavior uh, at, the, at the synapse. Okay, this particular nonlinearity is one that I found uh, in, um, in a paper from uh, IBM from Typhoon Gutman. Uh, so it's been actually um, uh, used uh, for, for modeling um, crossbar arrays. And um, you see, it's not, it doesn't work perfectly yet, but as you start from the baseline and I've chosen these parameters, they are horrible parameters. I mean, this, it makes the model very nonlinear. So if you apply it, if you just apply that nonlinearity, you basically lose almost all performance. A chance would be at 80% here. And as we meta learn, and this isn't even finished here, um, so you recover uh, part of, of, of that loss. But this is just to illustrate the idea that if you have non-idealities in your hardware or all these problems, if you're meta learning, it, this may not be a problem anymore. You can learn around it. So I'd like to summarize, I think I'm over uh, my time slot, um, that, uh, well, continual learning is difficult. Um, some say that the applications are not well-defined. I would just say that uh, it's such a difficult problem that we cannot comprehend the applications uh, uh, yet. Uh, nevertheless, it remains that we don't know how to use this online learning. And uh, for sure, tabula rasa uh, learning on neuromorphic hardware, I think is uh, for the moment, in the first years, it's a little bit of a fool's errand, uh, which in, in which I'm, I've also uh, contributed. <laughs> um, so, so coming back to the title of the talk, so how do you use synaptic plasticity in hardware, in neuromorphic hardware today? Um, so you have to first have this data set of data sets. So there's many creative ways in which you could uh, uh, create some, such a data set. 
you pre-train uh, a model of your network, including the algorithmic and the hardware constraints. So this can be the fact that you're constrained in range, um, that your updates are not linear and so on. Then you transfer that onto uh, your hardware and then you can do few shot learning. Uh, basically you can do learning on the hardware in an effective way, okay? The advantage here is that, well, you have data efficiency and you avoid this catastrophic forgetting problems and you're compensating for all this nonlinearity. And I'd like to just make the point clear here that no matter what you do, uh, so because you're not going to do a tabula rasa approach, you have to pre-train your hardware anyway. If you're going to do it, better pass it through a meta-learning approach rather than um, you know, just uh, pre-training on the same task, right? It'll, be, it'll just perform much better on, on, on a, a variety of tasks. And a few eye openers, which at least they were eye openers for me that are related to this, is that we, in the same way that, uh, you know, others have done in, in mind, you don't need to learn only on synaptic plasticity. Why do we think of learning on, with synaptic plasticity and weights is because that's where we store this long-term memory and we need to have long-term memory to learn on a whole, on a large data set. But what if um, the, this, uh, large chunk of the learning is done in pre-training, which may happen in terms of synaptic plasticity, but actual learning on the spot, like we're doing with the TUFA, was learned, for example, in the activations or in more short-term uh, memory. You, that, that will absolutely work. In fact, you can even think of that as being a way of doing uh, working memory. So we don't need to think of synaptic plasticity as the only way of learning. And this is enabled through the fact that we can do, um, we can meta-train these networks. And the other eye opener is that, you know, a lot of the field has been focusing on these um, um, problems such as endurance, drift, and so on, but maybe they won't be a problem after all, because um, especially for endurance, we're not going to need so many updates uh, for, for this type of problem. So I think there's a, there's a big field that, that can grow from, uh, from this. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, uh, collaborators, so Friedemann, and we did a lot of work together. Uh, Kenneth, uh, who did some of the experiments here, and some of the other folks that we, uh, with whom we worked on the surrogate gradients. People like Chomsky seem to think that uh, we're, we have evolved certain structures in uh, uh, the human brain that predispose us to language and ability to learn many different languages fairly easily. Do you foresee uh, a way of using some of this uh, uh, meta-learning results as a, uh, a generic cognitive enhancer for, you know, that spreads across many different domains, not just a particular task area. Uh, I do. Uh, I, so I don't, I wouldn't go as far as to say as uh, model agnostic meta learning is the way to go. I think um, it doesn't, you know, you have to realize that it's doing uh, gradient descent of gradient descent, so it can get pretty expensive. However, you know, meta learning can be done in several different ways, including evolutionary methods or these uh, heuristic methods um, that search in this uh, in this space. And so, I think a lot of the work that that's gone into those fields can actually actually be applied uh, to this as well. And I, you know, I don't want to say that people haven't done this. Um, it's just that we had this particular opportunity to use model agnostic meta learning because we had the ability. We, we knew now that we can use these surrogate gradients, which were themselves differential. Yeah. But uh, what I like, would like to do, so Steve, just to kind of expand from your question, is um, now that I'm here at Ulish, there's a large supercomputer sensor here, it's really to build the system, uh, this uh, training mech uh, for you know, massively training these networks and find a good initial uh, state so that the people can you know, download these networks onto their hardware um, and, um, uh, and, and you do, do fast learning in the same way that you would download your, uh, you know, um, uh, ResNet 101 um, and not train it from scratch from ImageNet. Right. So it's almost like uh, pre-configured hardware, not just configured, but possibly built into the hardware. That, that's right. That's right. But where you would still be doing learning uh, potentially over all the layers, right? Not just talking about fixing a part of the network and training the last layer. You can train the entire network here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe one question from my side, Emma, about uh, error triggered learning. Um, if you go back to, or uh, we don't need to show, show the slide. 
So you have this third factor in the error triggered learning um, that has this dual purpose, right? It's it's triggering the synaptic weight update mm -hmm. and it's also conveying an error signal. So mm -hmm. how do you merge these two purposes together? And usually when I think about an, an event triggered or a triggered update, it, it, it's binary, it's, it's on or off. But then you want it to be analog as well to converse on sort of error signal. So do you have a spike with a payload or how do you merge those? Uh, yeah, well, yes. Yeah. So here we are sending spikes. In this case, you see there are trinary events actually. So negative and positive. I guess you could create two pathways, one for positive, one for a negative. Um, so so I guess that's how, that's how we have the payload. How do they play this? Um, dual role actually quite naturally i mean it's something like um uh well the error here is not stochastic but you can think of a little bit as a stochastic estimation uh, of the errors and you just send these events in a random fashion during that time um and uh over time it's going to integrate this uh, in the weights as, as it's learning so i i don't it, it, Think that there's, in fact, I mean, it, it is kind of implementing it in a, in a natural way. I'm not sure I could answer that question any better. Thank you. I think there's, oh yeah, there's just uh, feedback in the comments. Any other questions for Emre? All right. Well, thank you very much, Emre, for nicely outlining all the challenges that we face with uh, learning a normal hardware, but also presenting some very nice and promising solutions for that. I'm uh, sure. really looking forward to reading those papers that you mentioned. <laughs>